Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this London Clinic uh, lecture uh, today on Valentine's Day. What a special day to have uh, a lecture. I'm so pleased that we've got uh, 700 people signed up for this uh, lecture. That's about twice and two and a half times more than we could possibly have had if we'd been uh, in-house at the RSM, as we usually have been for this lecture. So with no further ado, I should say that, of course, I'm Roger Kirby, president of the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm going to hand over to Satya Bhattacharya, who is uh, the medical director of the London Clinic, and Satya is going to introduce our wonderful speaker tonight to uh, hear about the genetics, uh, genetic aspects of uh, gynecological cancers and a lot more, I'm sure. Over to you, Satya. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, it is my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, uh, uh, Professor Ranjit Manchandra. In case you're wondering what the London Clinic has to do with this lecture, uh, the London Clinic is London's oldest and largest independent hospital, and we are just down the road from here on Harley Street. We are a charity, and as part of our charitable purpose, we sponsor an annual lecture at the Royal Society of Medicine, and today's lecture is one such. Uh, Ranjit Manchandra is Professor of Gynecological Oncology uh, at the Wolfson Institute of Population Health, Queen Mary University of London. He's also consultant gynecological oncologist at Bart Health NHS Trust, and we've been consultant colleagues there. His research interests are focused around targeted precision prevention. Uh, he will tell you more about it, so I shall not go into what that involves. He is principal investigator on numerous trials, including the Protector trial, which is running at the moment. He ha he's had numerous awards given to him, including one for an NHS Innovation Accelerator role. Um, he leads the high-risk women's pre precision prevention clinic at Bart's Health and chairs the London Cancer High-Risk Gynecological Cancer MDT. He has various roles in uh, academia and training, which I shall not go into. Without further ado, Ranjit, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Satya. Thank you, Roger. It's uh, an honor and privilege to be here. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to give this annual uh, lecture. I'm going to talk to you about something I feel passionate about, and that's uh, my work around population gene testing for cancer predisposition. Uh, just my disclosures to begin with, the population testing work uh, is funded by the EVE Appeal, Some Aspects by Cancer Research UK, and the NHS Innovation Accelerator. I have other declarations of funding from other research studies and other honorarium. We also work quite closely uh, with a number of cancer charities, uh, support groups, uh, including in the general and Jewish populations, In my talk, I'm going to cover the background to this issue, talk about the Jewish population model for gene testing, talk about general non-Jewish population studies, uh, and then end with some future directions of where I think we're headed. So breast cancer, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and colorectal or bowel cancer account for 50% of women's cancers. These are 4.9 million cases annually globally and the UK burden of disease is about 116,000 cases. If you look at data from the International Association of Research for Cancer, that's the global can predicting model, then the number of cases and deaths both are slated to increase for these cancers, more across the world, but also definitely across the UK. And you can see the numbers um, are quite large. So the, there's a big challenge before us. My research strategy has been focused around improving identification of high or increased risk groups, which can then lead to better screening, earlier diagnosis, as well as improving targeted prevention and risk management, all with the aim of reducing cancer incidence and mortality. Now, the various different strategies to improve identification of high risk groups, but today I'm going to cover population gene testing. I think this is the most powerful approach. The traditional method of identifying individuals at increased risk has been based on family history. So there's a strong family history of cancer, then uh, you may access gene testing. And 
usually it's based on what's called a carrier probability. So there's a high chance of carrying a gene mutation based on your family history assessment, which involves different types of statistical assessments. Uh, then the health system may offer you a gene test. And this is Angelina Jolie. We all know Angelina Jolie. She carries a BRCA1 gene mutation. She has a high risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Breast cancer risk about 70% and ovary cancer of hers about 44%, but depending on the gene you carry, it varies from 17 to 44. Her mother had breast and ovarian cancer. Her maternal aunt had breast cancer and grandmother ovarian cancer. So she's a celebrity with the best access to healthcare and she underwent gene testing, was found to carry a BRCA1 gene mutation and was able to undergo a risk-reducing salpingo oophorectomy, that surgery to improve the tubes and ovaries and surgery to, improve, to remove breast tissue, a mastectomy to reduce her cancer risks. However, not everybody is like Angelina Jolie and only a small proportion of carriers who have a significant family history know about it, act on it. So there's limited awareness and restricted access to gene testing. With those watching in the audience, I mean, how many of you may know your three generation family history and the details of it and therefore understand the implications of it. And we have a very well informed audience here. So over half the carriers, 50% of carriers are missed if we use family history as a surrogate for identifying people who carry a pathogenic variant or a gene mutation. This is work we did um, a few years ago. We went into the genetic laboratories across the 16 million London population, extracted the data and looked at the bracket gene testing that's been done, matched it for postcode and population prevalence. And we showed uh, that only 3% of estimated BRCA carriers in the population across 16 million population in Greater London had been identified through NHS testing. Similarly, there have been reports over the last few years demonstrating restricted uptake and restricted access to gene testing in people who are eligible for genetic testing. So there's huge underutilization of gene testing and 96, 97% of the carriers who are at risk remain unidentified. We also modeled the data we collected, and we, we found that in 2007 or 8, there was a surge in gene testing rates in the NHS, which is a great thing. It's probably associated with the expansion in gene genetic services at the time. But also, if we extrapolated that, there is a proportion of people who always remain un undetectable because of the strategy we have. And even if you doubled the current detection rates, it would take another 200 years to pick up these people at risk. So the current system, I would argue, is not working well enough to maximize the technology we have to offer prevention and maximize prevention. If you look at the four cancers I mentioned, breast, ovary, bowel, and endometrial, then 20% of ovarian cancers, about 4% of breast cancers, 3% of endometrial cancers, and 4% of colorectal cancers are caused by one of these high-risk gene mutations, which are listed out here. I estimate there are about 535,000 such cancer susceptibility gene carriers across the UK. Most of them don't know about it, a large number of them will get cancer. These are potentially preventable cancers. So what are the advantages of finding out if you have a pathogenic variant or a gene mutation? Depending on the cancer phenotype, there's the option of surgical prevention, definitely for breast and ovarian cancer. There's the option of risk-reducing salping or oophorectomy, or early salpingectomy and delayed oophorectomy, or hysterectomy and bilateral salping or oophorectomy in women who are like Lynch syndrome, for example, or a risk-reducing mastectomy. So there's a range of surgical options. These are effective. They do reduce your cancer risk. There's the option of medical prevention. So tamoxifen or anastrozole, we know reduce breast cancer risk, and aspirin can reduce bowel cancer risk and risk of cancers in women who have Lynch syndrome or men. There's the option of intensive screening, whether for breast or colonoscopy in those who have an increased risk of colorectal cancer. People can make a range of lifestyle and reproductive choices or undergo pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to manage the cancer risk. Of course, testing has its risks or its downsides. There are always pros and cons to any medical intervention. Gene testing is no different. There's the issue of family dynamics, emotional impact, issue of anxiety, distress, confidentiality, potential insurance implications. In some communities, there's the issue of manageability, stigmatization, and the intervention needs to be cost-effective for the health system. 
These are all issues we need to address. So one of the things I'm, I'm curious, why do we need to wait for people to get cancer to identify people in whom we can prevent cancer? So largely our health system is working in this way and most people accessing gene testing need to have had cancer or the family members need to have had cancer to, to access gene testing. Uh, and for me, I think this is a failure of cancer prevention. Population testing offers us a strategy to try and address this and bridge this gap. So if I, as a gynae oncologist, if I sit in my clinic and I operate in women with ovarian cancer every week, one in five of them carries a gene mutation and gets an ovarian cancer, but it's potentially preventable cancer. So we asked ourselves a few years ago, or some years ago, can we test populations for cancer genes? And population testing for disease is well described in the literature. There are well set out guidelines for it. It was initially pr proposed by Wilson and Jagna in 1968. And these guidelines have evolved and developed over the years, and they have been modified. Our UK National Screening Committee has a very, very well developed set of guidelines. Their specific guidelines also published related genetic testing for genetic association of disease. I quite like uh, this chart. This depicts some of the important issues well. And this is the ACCE diagram, uh, which suggests that if, you want to, if you're going to test for a gene which is associated with disease, or in, in this context of what we're talking cancer, then clearly there must be clinical utility or a purpose or healthcare value. There's no point testing for something for which you can do nothing about. We need to understand the gene disease association or the performance characteristics. The assay you use needs to be reliable and accurate, and you need to understand the ethical, legal, and social implications. So clearly you could test populations if you can pick up more people at risk. You know the cancer risk. We need to understand the impact on someone's psyche and well-being. Do they get hugely distressed? What's the impact on their quality of life? Is it acceptable, feasible? Can, is it cost effective for the health system? And you can't have everybody coming into clinic or hospitals. So you need new approaches for delivering it or implementation studies. So I'm going to talk about the Jewish bracket testing model for population testing. So why the Jewish bracket testing model? So the Jewish population is one where BRCA mutations are far more frequent. So one in 40 Ashkenazi Jewish individuals carry a BRCA gene. And it's one of three common variants called founder mutations in that population, compared to one in 200 to 300 in the general population. So you need a much smaller sample size to address a question and also the cost of testing is much less and it's quite specific to these three mutations. Additionally, the potential impact is greater because 40% of ovarian cancers and 10% of breast cancers in the Jewish population are caused by one of these genes, which is two and a half times greater than the wider general population. So across North London, we ran a randomized trial um, and this was called the GCAPS trial. I started doing my work in population testing with this study. It was part of my PhD project. Um, and we randomized people to population testing versus testing on the basis of family history. A thousand, little over a thousand people entered the study. It was preceded by a year uh, of intense engagement with the community. I work with a large number of community charities. It was funded by the Eve Appeal. And we looked at outcomes in psychological well being, quality of life, the impact of the test result, number of carriers identified, and the health economics. We published a range of papers, uh, a large number of studies, uh, sorry, papers from this uh, since 2015 onwards, the last one being just a few months ago. And I'm going to summarize the data uh, in the next few slides. So we clearly show that up to 60% of BRCA carriers are missed through the clinical criteria-based testing in the NHS. The prevalence was consistent with what we was initially described in the literature. We found 2.9% of Ashkenazi Jews carrier a BRCA mutation, roughly evenly split between BRCA1 and BRCA2. It was feasible, acceptable, had high satisfaction of over 95%. We looked at different ways of delivering this. We used a DVD-based assisted uh, counseling approach compared to traditional face-to-face -face counseling. And in a non-inferiority non randomized trial, we showed that this was equivalent in terms of uptake and non-inferior in terms of knowledge, risk perception, and satisfaction and it was delivered outside a hospital setting within the community. 
We recently published uh, about a year or so ago, the long-term outcome data from the study, which is a, at least three years follow-up. And when you compare family history and population testing, then we showed a significant reduction in anxiety in population versus family history testing. Now, this was a statistical reduction, doesn't necessarily mean it had a clinical implication, but what's really important is that the curve wasn't going in the opposite direction. There was no difference in depression, uncertainty, overall impact, or distress with testing. Health anxiety decreased with time, both in the population and family history screening testing arms but there was no difference between the two approaches to testing. We found no change in quality of life overall, no change in mental quality of life, all the physical quality of life decreased with time equivalently, similarly in both arms, but we know that happens to a normative population as we get older, we, come, we get physically less active. We looked at the various factors which may have affected the uptake of testing. When people came forward, clearly there was established interest, so they wouldn't come forward for gene testing. At the outside, outset, 60% had an intention to undergo BRCA testing. 88% took up testing subsequently following counseling. One of the main, well, the various factors we've published in the literature, but the main drivers were reinsurance, reassurance and reduction of uncertainty. Additionally, those who were married or cohabiting were more likely to undergo testing compared to those who were single. People understood the various limitations because those who provided more weightage to the limitations and risks of testing were less likely to undergo testing and this discriminated between the acceptors and the decliners. And that's really what you want to see. That's informed decision-making. Now, as we're talking about testing in the Jewish population, we know the Jewish population has a Jewish cultural and religious identity and also has distinct denominational affiliations. And we looked at the difference in uptake of testing across a cultural religious identity scale, as well as whether it would be different in those who were liberal or reform or conservative or orthodox or unaffiliated. And we didn't find an association with respect to denominational affiliation and uptake of testing. So there was good acceptability across all strata. This is a paper we published last year. We've also looked at impact on general lifestyle, such as your diet, uh, alcohol consumption, smoking, and breast cancer screening, subsequent to population testing versus family history testing. We found an increase in vitamin intake with population screening. I'm not quite sure why this is the case. It could be a chance finding. There is some data on direct-to-consumer testing shows increase in uptake of complementary medicine in those who undergo direct-to-consumer testing. Uh, so it could be either a chance finding or something that requires more research or looking into. We found no difference in alcohol quantity, physical activity, smoking, diet, or routine breastfeeding behavior. So people who you would normally meant to be going for the mammograms continue to do so. And just because you tested negative for the BRCA gene, you didn't start drinking more or smoking more. I'm going to come down to the health economics uh, of this approach. So it's critically important that if we introduce a new intervention in the health system, that it's cost-effective or it's not sustainable. And health economics or cost-effectiveness analysis provides us uh, a way to do so, where you weigh up the costs and consequences of two strategies. One is your current strategy of care versus the alternative strategy of care. So something that's routinely used in the cost effectiveness analysis, something called the utility score. So you imagine uh, a situation where zero is death and one is perfect health. And all of us are somewhere along this line of zero to one. And we could all report our quality of life to be somewhere along this line, irrespective of what health state we're in. So it'd be different for someone who's had breast cancer, say stage one to breast cancer stage four, or pancreatic cancer, or someone different for ovary cancer, or someone who's just fractured a leg or an elbow but it gives you a number which can be extrapolated across health states and diseases, and therefore is useful to use from the point of view of looking at equity across intervention and health diseases and economic modeling. If you multiply this utility score by survival, which is something we're all familiar with, you get what's called a quality adjusted life year, which is an important metric in our cost effectiveness analysis. A number of us are used to reading things like ISERP or QALY, 
And we know that our National Institute of Health and Care Excellence has a threshold of 20 to 30,000 pounds per ISA per quality. This is the quality bit in that equation, and I'll just talk about the ISA bit. So it's really the total costs of your old your new intervention minus the old intervention divided by the total qualities of health benefit of the new minus the old. So it's a straightforward mathematical formula, but getting to these numbers can be quite complex modeling and undertaking. So you end up in a situation where like this is a plane where you have cost and effectiveness in terms of quality. So if you have a new strategy, which is more costly and less effective, we shouldn't adopt it. it, doesn't make sense. You have a strategy which is more effective, saving more life years and it's cheaper, it does make sense to adopt it. So things in between, we have a decision rule and different health systems have their decision rules. In the UK, we have it at about 30,000 pounds per quality and in the US, it's $100,000 per quality. So we did a cost effectiveness analysis comparing the two strategies of population testing for the Jewish population. And we've published about three, four papers now on this issue. And this clearly showed that it was cost saving in the NHS to do population testing for the Jewish population. It reduced breast and ovarian cancer incidence. Uh, the initial paper we published was based on four Ashkenazi Jewish grandparents. So we subsequently revisited it and went back and did it across a variation of one to four Ashkenazi Jewish grandparents because that could affect the prevalence of BRCA in the population and therefore affect the cost effectiveness analysis. And you can see most of the numbers are still negative. So that means it's cost saving, but it's cost effective at one Ashkenazi Jewish grandparent and remains cost saving at two to four Ashkenazi Jewish grandparents. So this would save lives and money. Subsequent, when this was adopted uh, as an, when I got the NIA fellowship and this was taken up by the NHS Innovation Accelerator, the commission, the York Health Economic Consortium to undertake an independent review uh, and do an independent analysis of this. And they confirmed that this approach would be cost saving to 4.4 million pounds in the NHS with a reduction in breast and ovarian cancer cases. So to summarize our findings from the Jewish population work, the population bracket testing, the Jewish population is feasible, acceptable, has high satisfaction, is cost effective, it can be undertaken in the community setting, it's non-inferior and cost efficient, free test counseling approaches can be used and does not harm psychological health or quality of life. Now, in addition to the randomized trial we did, there have been other cohort studies which have been undertaken across the world, where my colleague, Alfred Lavila had has run one in Israel. Uh, there's the gene screen running, uh, by Leslie Andrews in Australia. Steve Narod and his team have done a study in Canada and colleagues in the US have been running the B4 study, which recently published. It's Ken Moffat, uh, Susan Domchek, Judy Garber, uh, and, and other colleagues. So GCAPS was the only randomized trials. The others were cohort studies, but all of them have used a range of counseling and testing approaches. Uh, we use pre-test counseling, which is DVD based, uh, other, the Israeli, US and Canadian studies just use pre-test education with counseling provided for the post-test carriers. While in the gene screen study, they're using a, a combination of two approaches, which is just pre-test education, as well as group counseling. So we met a couple of years ago at the BASA Center uh, as a consortium of investigators undertaking this research. Uh, it was hosted by Susan Domchek and I had the privilege of chairing that meeting. So the, there are also therefore papers published by the other cohort studies, which again confirm the benefit of advantages of population testing uh, and the safety, feasibility, and acceptability of this. I think it's time to change the paradigm of the Jewish population. Um, it's great that Israel uh, is the first health system worldwide to adopt population testing for BRCA found mutations with the Ashkenazi and the Jewish population. And their implementation started last year. Uh, in the UK, we are. Uh, this is something we're working on with the NHS Innovation Accelerator, and also it's on the agenda of the NHS Cancer Program Early Diagnosis Task and Finish Group, which is looking at possibilities. And Susanna Lukic and Emily Watts are the program managers looking uh, in, uh, into this area or, uh, of population testing. Just to mention, this is a study which is about the kickoff from QM. That's uh, Katrina Sari, who's leading a lot of this work uh, with us. Um, and the aim is to review the current level of BRCA awareness and information provision for testing in the community at the moment. 
So what is being provided, whether it's NHS or private providers, also we want to look at what is the level of education, information, support provided by community charity organizations, national cancer charity organizations, and so on. And this is endorsed by the Jewish Leadership Council and should nicely complement some of the other work being done and feed into the early diagnosis task and finish group work. Uh, this is a leaflet and Katrina is helped by other members in the team. Uh, that's Monica, Sam, Ashwin, and Michael. Uh, so we aim to publish a community report. There will, of course, be some scientific output and, and hopefully some recommendations uh, for actions at a community level. So general pop the general population testing, uh, moving on from the Jewish population. So our general population surveys, and as a gynecologist, uh, gynecologist, we, of course, we have a large focus on ovary cancer. So some of the work I'm going to talk about is going to be ovary cancer related, but also then going to cover other genes. Uh, so we clearly demonstrated that there was 85% interest with a 70% intention to un undertake a healthier lifestyle or undergo screening and prevention with respect to an ovarian cancer risk estimation using population testing. So a large proportion of women were interested in it, and a large proportion of them said they would undergo screening preventive strategies if they were at increased risk. Oops. So one of the questions we asked ourselves a few years ago is, what is the threshold at which we should offer surgical prevention? It had never been defined properly in the literature. There was a conventional threshold of 10%, but there was no scientific basis for it. So this is something we modeled and published, and we demonstrated that it would be cost-effective for the health system to offer surgical prevention at over a 4 to 5% lifetime risk level, and this could save 7 to 10 years of a woman's life. So that's a huge amount. I don't think there's a drug in ovarian cancer that provides you that level of benefit. How else is the 5% level important? Colleagues in Cambridge uh, have modeled the threshold of risk at which you get ovarian cancer, and they've clearly showed that one in three cases occur at a 10% risk threshold, but 60% of cases occur at the 5% risk threshold. So if we can identify this proportion of women, we clearly have a large population in whom we can do prevention to address the burden of disease for the future. So would a 5% risk threshold be acceptable to women? Uh, this is a randomized survey uh, in general population women where we asked women whether they would be willing to undergo pre prevention uh, at these different risk levels. And we showed that irrespective of how you arrived at a risk, whether it's basis of uh, a SNP profile and other risk factors or a high risk gene, 83% wanted to know if they were in cancer risk and surgical uptake for prevention was similar across all risk groups and a number of them would opt for surveillance or lifestyle changes. So we've been arguing for broadening guidelines for what women can access prevention. And I think from an ovarian cancer perspective, you can stratify the population to low risk, so under a four to 5% level, an intermediate five to 10%, and then the high risk genes, which are 10% and beyond. And you can arrive at this level based on your family history, so number of ovarian cancers in the family, using a SNP profile or the risk genes which are associated with ovarian cancer, which now include some of the newer moderate penetrance genes like BRIP1 and PALB2 or RAT51C, 51D, the Lynch syndrome genes and the traditional suspects, BRCA1 and BRCA2. This is a scientific impact paper we've just published for the Royal College, which addresses the issue of surgical prevention, HRT use at different risk levels. So we're moving into an arena where we can use a bunch of risk factors, a large number of risk factors which are available, whether it's demographic, reproductive, hormonal, contraception age, family history, for breast cancer, the breast density, a SNP profile and genes, all put into a complex algorithm to produce a cancer risk. So for ovarian cancer, you can use that risk algorithm again to stratify women as we discussed. And this is something that uh, was undertaken in the PROMISE program. And this is a personalized ovarian cancer risk model, which is the same as the CAN risk model work led by Antonis San Antonio in Cambridge. Uh, this is some work we were involved in. Uh, and it was validated in the UK CTOX study. 
And this uh, showed uh, that you could use a personalized ovarian cancer risk algorithm to predict a woman's ovarian cancer risk. And you observe by expected cancers are not far off a straight line, which is what you like to see. We use this risk algorithm to go and do a pilot population testing study to see if women would be would want to know their ovarian cancer risk and test them for a range of ovarian cancer risk genes, SNPs, uh, and give them an individualized risk assessment. We found 85% uptake in a pilot study, um, and these women were willing to undergo surgical prevention at a 5% risk level, should they be found to have this. It had 86 to 99% satisfaction. We found a reduction in cancer worry, reduction in risk perception, and no significant impact on psychological well being or quality of life. We did this through primary care using, we built a bespoke web app decision aid, web based decision aid, and used a telephone helpline. About one in seven women used the telephone helpline. Similarly, ovarian cancer is usually five years behind breast cancer, at least. And the PROCAST study has been using a risk adaptive screening for breast cancer. Uh, it's been work uh, led by Professor Gareth Evans in Manchester. And they've been using, again, a personalized breast cancer risk assessment approach using a SNP profile and mammographic density and other variables to predict someone's breast cancer risk and therefore adapt your breast cancer screening strategy. This is the direct using model which has been used. And this approach has been shown to be potentially cost effective also. We now have a new randomized trial kicking off, uh, which uses, which compares standard breast screening to risk adaptive breast screening, again, using an approach which uses a SNP profile uh, and mammographic density and other risk factors to give a personalized risk assessment. So we will be moving into the area arena, I think in the future of improved algorithms to personalize risk calculation, which will involve both epidemiological factors, genetic risk factors. Um, and as these tools get better validated and used and validated in prospective trials, yeah, there will be opportunity to use them in large scale population testing studies. So what about cost effectiveness of general population testing? Uh, we've shown that it's cost effective for a health system, both in the US and the UK to test for a range of panel of breast and ovarian cancer gene mutations. And this is paper we published about three years ago. Uh, and you could prevent a large number of more breast and ovarian cancers compared to the current strategy. This is a, what's called a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. So in, in the model, when you do these models, there are a large number of variables. And therefore, but all of those variables may have a range of estimates. And they're not acting singly. So when they, there are different ways to do sensitivity analysis. You can take one variable and say, oh, if, if this was X or Y, how does it change your result? But actually all of them act together. So we do what's called simulation modeling, where we model all the variables at different extremes of the estimates. And you try and compare the results of different strategies. And as your willingness to pay threshold increases, so as you approach the $100,000 per quality or £30,000 per quality mark, you find that the population testing becomes more cost effective, a family history standard clinical approach becomes less. And so 93% to 84% of simulations, this approach is more cost effective than the current strategy. If we did do this, if we calculated a population in potential impact, you could prevent tens of thousands more breast cancers and ovarian cancers, both in the UK or the USA. Uh, this was analysis for these two countries and clearly it depends on the size of the population. So what about other countries? We did look at it from a more global point of view to try and assess it across high income countries, upper middle income countries and low middle income country health systems. And this is a economic evaluation of population bracket testing across the UK, USA and Netherlands as examples of high income countries, China and Brazil of upper middle income countries and India as a low middle income country. I'm sorry about this slide, uh, but the key message will come in a minute. Uh, so we've done uh, an analysis based on WHO guidelines for all the countries, and also we did an analysis based on local health economic guidelines which existed for the UK, USA, and the Netherlands. And in a nutshell, what we showed was uh, all these red boxes are below your willingness to pay thresholds. So for the UK, USA, Netherlands, China, Brazil, it's cost effective. 
for the UK, USA, and Netherlands, if you use a societal perspective, it's cost saving. However, for a low income country like India, it would not be cost effective at the current cost of testing. If the cost fell to about $172, you could begin to see it becoming cost effective from a societal perspective and at about $100 mark from the payer perspective. I think the cost of testing is going to fall further in the future. It's already fallen probably tenfold since when I started working in this area some years ago. Demonstrating the potential population impact of this approach, depending on the country, whether it's UK, USA, Netherlands, China, Brazil, or India, you will prevent so many more breast and ovarian cancers, and the numbers go up as the size of the population increases. So tens of thousands more cancers to be potentially prevented. So I'm very keen that we change, move towards changing the paradigm. I think there's an opportunity and there's a need to do it in the Jewish population. Clearly the general population testing needs more research and work, but that's a direction of travel. We need to move from a restricted access to gene testing to more population level testing. Uh, this is Lisa, this is uh, one of our participants in our population testing study who was found to have uh, a gene mutation for which she then underwent screening and preventive interventions and she would not have been identified but for a population testing approach. So where do we go? We are very keen um, to undertake a population testing program in the UK, and we have a well-developed program called the PROTECT study. Uh, the intention is to go through primary care networks. We will build a web app and decision aid to deliver this uh, using a telephone counseling approach, which we sort of piloted in our previous work and do direct to patient or saliva DNA based testing. There'll be electronic consent. Following gene panel testing, identification of mutations, we can identify, do cascade testing to identify pathogenic variant carriers in the family, provide post test counseling support, log into our health system and offer them screening and preventive interventions, lifestyle, and other benefits to manage their cancer risk. Uh, we propose we have uh, social ethics and qualitative arm of variant of uncertain significance, monitoring and management arm and the health economic arm with long-term analysis of outcomes to demonstrate uh, benefit. The four work streams, one's a population testing cohort, one is a, a qualitative research and empirical ethics study, one's a VUS management arm, and one's a health economics arm. We want to build a VUS interface patient interface and monitor and manage this. Uh, this is support from a large number of cancer charities, patient support groups, NCRI, the NIA, Eve Appeal, uh, and a number of academic institutions are involved, uh, been involved in developing the program. Uh, Queen Mary, Manchester, St. George's, Edinburgh, Oxford, UCL, LSHTM, Leeds, um, Amsterdam, and ICR. So some take home messages from my side. Uh, do we prevent more cancers through population testing? Yes. Do we identify more people at risk of population testing? Yes. Are we causing psychological quality of life harm? Don't think so. If our studies suggest we don't. Is the high satisfaction? Yes. Is it feasible and acceptable? Yes, we've demonstrated this. Can we do it outside a hospital setting? Yes. Is it cost effective? Yes. Should we change the paradigm and offer it to all of the Jewish population? I strongly believe we should. Israel is on it and I hope we can follow suit somewhere down the line. With respect to general population testing, we need more research and implementation studies. We have a well-developed program for which we're looking for funding um, to deliver this. Some important principles, we need to do it only for those genes of established clinical utility. The list and the applicability of what we use it for will change over time. We need to consider equal access and equity with respect to underprivileged, underserved populations, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. We need robust context specific delivery, a delivery model and downstream management pathways. And this will change for depending on, I think the health system in which this comes into play. I don't think there'll be a one size fits all approach. It will be different contexts with different health systems. We need to get a public messaging right. It needs to be consistent, accurate, unbiased. And we need better public patient awareness and engagement. So, um, Thank you. And I've just acknowledged a number of people who've been involved in this journey and this research. 
uh, my research team and uh, really do a lot of heavy lifting and hard work. Uh, so Sam, Monica, Michael, Lashwin, Shah, who's, uh, Lee, who's done all the cost effectiveness modeling, Nicole, Gita, Rosa, my close colleague, Katrina and Pfizer. Also like to acknowledge my clinical colleagues who support a lot of this work and enable me uh, to travel this journey. So one of them is missing because he just joined and I didn't have a picture, but James, you're there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're listening. Uh, uh, just acknowledge the huge work put in, uh, in developing the protect program by co-investigators and collaborators. Uh, so Gareth in Manchester, Claire at the ICR, Rosa at LSHTM, Ian Thompson, Usha, Professor Hallowell at Oxford, uh, Verl in Amsterdam, uh, Eamon, Nick and Judith in Leeds, uh, Stephen Duffy, Rian Gabe and Samantha Keefe at Queen Mary, Caroline Presho uh, and Imran Rafi. Again, lots of collaborators for the work we do across the world with uh, colleagues in as far from Melbourne to Brazil to India, uh, again, Amsterdam, uh, colleagues within the UK from Manchester, LSHTM, the USA, Lee Pearson team. Uh, so big thank you to everyone. Uh, my GCAPS team, where I started my work, my PhD supervised by Ian Jacobs and Usha Menon, uh, and the Promise Program colleagues. Uh, lots of thank yous, so thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ranjit. We've got a few questions mm -hmm. in, and we, yeah, we're happy to take a few more if you'd like to send them in using the Zoom question panel. Um, I'm going to start off with one question. I mean, that is a fantastic uh, slide of all your collaborators there. I mean, what's it like working with so many collaborators? I've, I've found in my career working with collaborators isn't always straightforward, but that's an amazing team. Um, and do you have a leader or, or, or do you, uh, is there any, anyone overall in charge or is it all? So the work, basis? well, most of the work I described is something that I've led. Yeah. Uh, with the collaborators you work with, there's invariably a lead collaborator for each center, depending on the work you're doing. Uh, but I mean, most work today is collaborative. It's very difficult to do this work in isolation. Yeah. Uh, and it's like managing any organization. Yeah. I mean, there's, President of the RSM, as you know, you manage lots of teams. <laughs> so I think so, Zoom must help. Uh, <laughs> we can try to get all those collaborators together in one room. Would be I think really Zoom good. helps, yeah. uh, but also different. So uh, different projects have different collaborators. Not everybody is working on one project. Sure. And there's a multiple of projects. Uh, so what you've seen is just an overview. But actually, when you get into the granularity, each one's got a specific role or su support function or contribution. Uh, whether yeah depending on the project. Okay, there's a question from an abandoned Supramenian, if I've got that, i pronounced that probably wrong. <laughs> yeah, I can't actually see the full um, text on, on, the, the, uh, on the iPad here. Um, how easy is it to get BRCA testing in London? That's a practical question. And I'm sure a lot that, of people in the audience. It, it's easy, to, but it depends on, your, depends on what sort of testing strategy. You're going through the NHS, you have to fulfill a genomic test type. Uh, direct criteria, which is based on a one in 10 probability of carrying a BRCA gene mutation. Yeah. Uh, if you are doing it privately, it's fairly easy. Lots of providers around. How much does it cost privately? Any idea? Uh, uh, you could get it cheaper, yeah. depending on the provider right. and what's thrown in with that uh, testing process. Uh, it, so in lot of, some of the work we've done, we, we can push the test down, cost down to as little as $200. Mm. Mm. So we definitely have quotes and providers at that level. Uh, one of the things there is this complete lack of consistency in what providers charge, whether it's in this country or across the world, and the range is quite huge depending on the test you want done. Right. Uh, Sounds but, a bit like COVID testing. <laughs> but there's a, it's a random quality but, to but, that. Yeah, I, look, 2007, 2008 used to be 2,000 pounds. Uh, or two and a half thousand, three thousand pounds. Yeah. And today you can get a whole panel for a few hundred pounds, three hundred, four hundred pounds. You can get whole genome sequencing for seven hundred pounds. Yeah. So the price is so the price is, is just is going down, down yeah. and it's going to go down further. And and you say that the the population risk at the moment is one in forty. The NHS criterion is one in ten. You have to have a one in ten risk before they'll do it for you free. Is that right? 
uh, one in ten chance of carrying it. The Jewish population is a completely different um, category. So I think it's a high prevalence, high risk population and shouldn't be treated the same as the general population. Yeah. Uh, so in them, it's one in 40, but it's much uh, less frequent, one to 200 approximately in the broader general population. Right. The estimates can vary from one in so if you went in to one in three fifty and said I come from a Jewish family, they would say, "Well, that's one in forty, so you can't have your." So the current the current uh, gene test. testing criteria doesn't allow you to have it unless you have a family history of cancer. Right. You've had cancer yourself. Uh, that is something where keen changes in the Jewish population. Right. Well, we've got Melita Irving here in the audience, specially invited this evening. Took her away from her husband on Valentine's Day. <laughs> who is the past president of the genetic section of the RSM. Malita, any, any questions from you? I'll, I'll have to repeat them because you don't have a microphone. Yes, thank you. So my question is, um, with respect to population testing, so you're looking over at a very specific panel of genes. Yes. Does it make better sense, or might this be the direction of travel to open it up to uh, some kind of polygenic risk score that takes into consideration SNPs across so the, the, yeah, the, just the, repeat that question because they would the audience wouldn't have heard it so, so melissa's question is to do a uh, polygenic risk score at the same time as doing that is the intention and direction of travel so we want to do it in phases we will be collecting dna and we will be doing prs score subsequently uh, we want don't want to provide it back to people unless we have validated models and there's a robust pathway which is downstream so i think as those validation studies happen and those models get developed. And there, is, there is a clear pathway for intervention for clear patient benefits. So clinical utility is robust and unambiguously established. We do intend to go back and do that, yes. That is part of the proposal. Okay, so more questions coming through here. There's, a, there's one from Fiona Murphy. Fiona was diagnosed at 25 with a mucinous ovarian cancer. She's BRCA negative, Lynch negative, but she has a strong family history of multiple primary cancers. Would she be eligible for genetic testing? She would be eligible for gene testing if she, if the, the person who's had ovarian cancer in the family would be the first person who would be eligible for gene testing. But what she would be, what one could do now is do some sort of a risk assessment based on her family history itself and see if she falls above our threshold for surgical prevention, which now sits at about 5%. Depending on the ovarian cancers in the family, uh, you may be able to reach uh, estimate an ovarian cancer risk for a particular individual, which could lie above uh, the threshold at which you can offer prevention to prevent someone from getting cancer. Then, then I suppose to some extent you, you mentioned this, but um, Toral Shah says, "Can you envision 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 a future where we can use SNP testing, genomics testing?" the whole population to reduce the risk of cancer. Absolutely, that's yeah. what where we, we're trying to get to. Yeah, absolutely right. That's where we want to get to. So Andrew says, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Does the uptake in acceptability of risk-reducing surgery vary by country? And does this affect uh, the impact and the cost effectiveness? Brilliant question. Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it does vary by country. And there are some countries where it's much higher you in our experience here we have about 50 55 percent uptake of surgical prevention or ovary not very different uh, for breast uh, some countries in the netherlands have much higher it, there, there is good literature in published to show that it varies across country and one of the things we do in our analysis it, is try uh, and estimate the minimum threshold of prevention you need to achieve to establish the cost effectiveness of this intervention so there's no point offering testing if most people don't undergo screening and prevention. But what is the minimum threshold you need the population to go for to for that to be cost effective for the health system to offer it and also therefore save lives and uh, lives in the process uh, is something we have looked at and published in a lot of our papers. It is precisely the reason through these prospective studies because we we know we modeled what is. Uh, the level of uh, of minimum uptake of surgical prevention or screening you need, but does it actually happen? That's really what we need to demonstrate, and that's what we want to do in protect that were described, which is why you need the five to eight year follow up, because it needs to hit that level. Otherwise, uh, it may not be cost effective if we don't hit that level of prevention. Whatever data we have so far suggests that women who or men who are identified through a population screening approach do go for screening and prevention. Do we know why Jewish families have such a high BRCA 
um, mutation um, risk? Is it the, the fact that they uh, kind of it's such a, a distinct population? Or? Yes, so I think there's there's a much smaller gene pool. Uh, there is a fair amount of marrying within the community. That's uh, proposed as one of the theories. So your Heidi Weinberg equation, p square is you know q square one, uh, where you have genetic equilibrium doesn't hold. Uh, so it's possible by chance certain characteristics or traits may become more frequent, even less frequent in such a population. So Hazel Fofi uh, says, is there any work done in genetic testing with regards to other communities, i.e. non-Jewish? For example, African-American females, the three cancer types, breast, lung and colorectal, make up half of all new cancer cases. And more locally, late stage diagnosis of breast cancer in England is more common in um, Black African and Black Caribbean yeah. adults. So. Yes, there is work being done. In fact, there was uh, a nice recent paper demonstrating this by colleagues in the States, uh, Mary Beth Terry uh, et al. Uh, and uh, there, is, yeah, th th there is work being done in this context, and clearly that's a higher risk community mm -hmm. uh, also. <clears throat> But John Mason says, who will the profits belong to coming, that come out of genetic testing revolution with all this data coming from the NHS? Who, who's going to make money out of this? Probably not you, Randy. Not me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Randy I, did not <laughs> arrive in a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> so I can tell you that. So, um, I guess providers of healthcare will, will make money. I think different health systems have to decide what sort of approaches they are going to use for population benefit. And different health systems have different models of delivering healthcare. I mean, in the UK, we have predominantly a state funded health system with some proportion being private funded. Uh, but in large other parts of the world, there's a more mix in the other direction. Um, ultimately, the population pays for it. But what is important is that it be the right amount that's charged, whichever way you pay for it, whether it's your taxes or for private healthcare. Mm -hmm. and it provides you some benefit and the health system can afford it. Do you only work on cancer um, genetics or do you work on cardiovascular genetics as well yourself, Ranjit? Me, I work on cancer genetics. Yeah. I don't work on cardiovascular genetics, but the implications can be for cardiovascular genetics yes. also. I remember talking to Charles Knight, the medical director of Barts, and he was saying that um, screening in cardiovascular disease is fraught with anxiety you know if you tell people they've got a higher risk of a heart attack because they've got calcium in their left anterior descending branch uh, they go a bit crazy with anxiety uh, so it's a whole different ball game but do you predict in the future that that not only cancer but cardiac and many other diseases will be predictable on genetic yes, testing yeah. absolutely yeah. Uh, i mean that's the reason to do these prospective studies to look at the support people need and look at things like anxiety and quality of life and um, in other ways you can modify the health. Um, our data suggests that whether you're testing using your clinical approach, which is current for population testing, anxiety is not going up. And for most people, anxiety goes down. Mm -hmm. For people you pick up at increased risk, definitely there is literature which shows that there may be an initial increase in anxiety, which then becomes better over a year. But overall, most people are satisfied. They um, uh, the, you know, they would recommend it to other people. It's like anything, it's a, there's a trade-off uh, of risks and consequences. Sure. I suppose the surgical prevention, I mean, a salpingo oophorectomy is done, probably done laparoscopically by somebody like Satya, and a guy, and a guy like just not a general surgeon. Um, but a bilateral mastectomy uh, with implants, it's quite a big deal, isn't it, for yes. a young woman? The, yes. And you're certain the psychological impact of that is balanced out by the risk reduction, I suppose it's, it'll yes. vary from individual to individual. You're right. And we have a very well developed infrastructure in our health system to manage this. Mm -hmm. We have high risk cancer MDTs yeah. to which um, risk reducing mastectomy teams go uh, and genetics colleagues are involved. So decision making, making is multidisciplinary. The support women receive is multidisciplinary. They have clinical nurse specialists embedded in these teams uh, and all of them see a psychologist. To support them through this. Yeah. So there are reasonably good satisfaction rates. I mean, risk reducing mastectomy is not without a share of complications, but all that we take into account and when we model these things also. Mm -hmm. And we've got in the audience, we've got Olivia Ragland, who's 34 weeks uh, advanced with a bulge uh, in the lower abdomen. And, <laughs> and from somebody like that, say that, that 
that uh, Olivia had pro proven positive with a BRCA mutation in her 20s, then she'd have to make a decision about whether to hang on and keep the ovaries and have the babies that she wants, uh, or to reduce the cancer risk by having the ovarectomy. But I guess you'd be able to leave it, have the children first, then do the cancer. So, yeah. yeah, so yeah. she found out in her 20s she'd be informed and she could really, I would argue, have an option to plan her choices going forward rather than not knowing about it. Uh, so you could make reproductive choices with respect to contraception, which would affect your risk. You could think about pre-implantation gene diagnosis or prenatal diagnosis. You may decide to have a family earlier. You may decide the timing at which you'd like to have children. Um, and uh, you would need to make a decision subsequently on when to have surgical prevention. That would depend on the type of gene mutation, your choices, your preferences, what part or stage in life you're at. And uh, it could be tubes and ovaries. It could be tubes alone, which can preserve the ovaries. But you, need, you should have completed your family before you embark on this journey. Uh, so, but those are yeah, the difficult choices that uh, women need to make. But they are also helpful choices from the point of view of reducing cancer risk, which we're not good at treating. Seven in 10 women who get ovarian cancer will die from it, unfortunately. And lots of people saying they like the lecture. That's good. Um, some people asking whether there, there will be a recording available. Yes, there will. We'll put it on YouTube. So people who uh, haven't been able to watch it tonight will be able to watch it. Uh, and then Frank Anafi says, population testing for Lynch syndrome. Do you think the NHS is ready to roll it out? So that's something you'll be looking at in the PROTECT study. The genes we will be testing both will be breast, ovary genes, and then Lynch genes. So I think we need to wait for that study, uh, but that's something we will assess in the study we propose to do. We are trying to get some funding mm -hmm. for. I'm glad you're being asked these questions rather than me. Uh, Mohamed Dewey says, what are your thoughts about the Galeri test, which is a new blood test that has the ability to detect more than 50 types of cancer th through a single blood specimen? Okay. Uh, there are uh, a number of studies uh, which are looking at this sort of approach. The Galeri test is one of them. That's uh, uh, looking at a test which can look at trying to detect multiple cancers at the same time. I think the research is ongoing and we need to wait and see what the results are before being able uh, to tell you how effective this sort of approach is going to be. We need perspective. We need well-designed prospective trials to answer these questions uh, robustly. Uh, and I think these studies that are ongoing are, are, are steps in that direction. Yes, there is, there is the potential for people making money out of uh, vulnerable patients, isn't there? And also, but I think we've had a fantastic lecture this evening and uh, the, the science uh, and the collaboration uh, and the amazing results you've got are fantastic. So. Al Russell from the London Clinic, CEO of the London Clinic, is going to come and uh, give a vote of thanks. Um, just stay here for the time being, Randy. And thank you, Al. Thank you, Roger. Um, the London Clinic operates as a charity, and uh, we have a commitment as a charity to advance healthcare for the benefit of the wider community. Uh, and that shows its face in a number of ways training, innovation, but also education. And we've been very proud sponsors of the uh, RSM lectures in, in recent years um, in order to support the education and dissemination of, of this kind of information. I, I can't think of a, a better topic um, to support than one we've heard today. Uh, cancer is a great passion for the London Clinic. Uh, it's a huge part of what we do. Uh, and indeed, uh, we are working with Professor Manchanda and his team uh, to support access uh, to genetic testing. Um, but it's bigger than us. Uh, it's a change in the paradigm, as you say, uh, and, and the impact this could have uh, on, on cancer in the future is enormous, and we're delighted um, uh, to be supporting it. Uh, so I'd like to close uh, and say thank you uh, to the Royal Society of Medicine uh, for hosting this fantastic event. Uh, thank you, Roger, for chairing it so ably. Uh, and of course, to Professor Manchanda for the fantastic work you're doing uh, and the brilliant lecture you've delivered to us tonight. Uh, and finally, thank you to all of you uh, that have logged in uh, tonight. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, and now you can go and have your Valentine's dinner wherever you may be. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye bye.